Hello everybody out there in TV land. I'm J.D. Wilkes and uh, this first tune is called Gob Iron Stomp. My name is uh, J.D. Wilkes. Uh, I'm from uh, Paducah, Kentucky, right here. And uh, I play uh, harmonica, blues harp, and banjo, and a little piano, and bass. They were the nerd instruments. I felt like I could relate. I've always held dear what others have discarded. From musical instruments to musical styles, folklore, and uh, other things that have fallen by the wayside as the years go by, I find them interesting. and. Um, I'm more into that than I am pop culture.
The Vine That Ate the South, uh, the, that's the book I wrote, and why I wrote it was I was homesick. I was over in Norway on tour, had been away from Kentucky from home for like months and uh, was ready to go home. And I started waxing poetic about Kentucky, uh, almost as a valentine, as a way of touching base back home in my mind. Lose a year in the forest, you ask? Impossible. How could you lose an entire year in one day? What could give a forest power like that? Well, as one of the old timers at the drugstore says, when a man is concocting a scheme, he's got his gears a turning. But he says the same holds true for the oaks, pines, and sycamores of the deadening. Their gears are turning too. Here's what I think he meant by that. As you may recall from high school science, tree rings are a sort of sketch of a timeline, one that depicts every year's worth of weather. Fires, blights, inchworms, and other natural causes leave discolorations too. Concentric as the ripples in a pond, they are readily available to anyone handy with a cross-cut saw. But here in the deadening, Perhaps there are markings left by supernatural forces as well. Things like the winds of time, ghosts, and the nightly pelting of stardust. With each passing year, tree rings are riddled with mystic information, like a horoscopic wheel chart or even an Indian mandala. And once its instructions are received from on high and its pith infused with magic, the deadening sets its gears to turning, deciphering the details as the years go by and rotating its tree rings like, well, decoder rings. There's no real way of knowing, but perhaps these wooden circles are more like the inner workings of a bank safe, free spinning tumblers that move within one another in opposing directions around a common center. Their notches catch like sprockets until the correct combination is achieved, until the desired results are unlocked. Whichever way these discs spin inside their bellies, the same old magnetism occurs, and when the time is right, the victims of the deadening are summoned, and their destinies are meted out in no uncertain terms. The approach I've always taken to writing songs and recording songs is Really, uh, writing, it's not, not so much I'm trying to write a hit. I'm writing like a little short story. Every song is more like a, a short story about things that I'm particularly fascinated with. The whole time I lived in Nashville, I was down there for like 15 years maybe, it never dawned on me or occurred to me that I should be trying to write a hit for the masses. I was just into writing what I find fascinating and I couldn't help myself. Oh, you couldn't ride up. You can tell the cat. 
the stuff I've put out over the years, the best things I ever did, there's a few Shack Shaker records, a Dirt Dauber record, there's a solo record, and there's my novel, the art that I made down in Murray. It was whenever I finally learned the, the, the craft of what I was after that uh, I was able to produce the things that I'm still proud of. subject of my dream project, I don't know if I am one of these guys that looks up to uh, my contemporary uh, heroes. I would rather get a shovel and go dig up some heroes like uh, Doc Boggs or Sonny Boy Williamson, Muddy Waters, Magic Sam, Charlie Feathers. Those guys, if I could make a Frankenstein out of, uh, out of all of them, we'd make a great record together. Down to FLA, good little folks of foul farewell. 
With his claw hammer high, he drew their spirits nigh. He danced amidst the crimson spray. He danced amidst the crimson spray. Blood, red blood on the blue, blue grass. Take heed, all ye motherless children so lost. Dwell not in the caves of your mind. Roderick Barrel's trail of sin that led him to his end. But bloody fields blossom blue in time. Bloody fields blossom blue in time. Blood that blood on the blue, blue grass. And grass and hallowed hunting ground. It was a big gun turn to that bloody black bag. of my songs are little short stories, I discovered way too late in life that I should have just been writing short stories. I mistook that talent for prose or verse for songwriting skills. And I was ill-equipped in Nashville without any dreams of becoming a hit writer. I was writing little short stories the whole time. The pleasure I receive from writing songs is the same that I receive from writing stories because they are the same. During our praise service, at morning assembly, while the Pentecostic preacher sang Jesus as if it were pronounced cheese sauce, I tried my dangdest to channel these mystical gifts. I even closed my eyes and lifted my hands up in praise like a TV antenna, maneuvering them as if to pull in a better signal. But the harder I tried, the worse I failed, and the worse I failed, the harder I tried, until I finally peeked to see if anyone was looking at me. No one saw me except some cute girl. She mouthed the word fag from across the room. I started attending the church school Sunday services too. I stood in awe of the congregation as the congregation babbled in tongues like a bunch of chickens. Even small children joined in the fray. One morning, the pastor's three-year-old son came and sat beside me. Upon the invocation, we all stood to praise the Lord. That's when I felt the child's tiny breath blowing hot on the back of my arm as he ululated in the spirit. This sensation left me shuddering as if someone were walking over my grave. What is this? How is it possible that this toddler can speak in tongues, but I can't? Surely there's no need for an innocent ch child or a kid to be slain in the Holy Spirit. Then again, consider the following. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, 14, King James Version. Yes, but I ask, isn't he the same unerring one who inspired our church fathers to decree an age of accountability, an exception that pardons children from judgment? Yes, he is the one and the same. But inconsist inconsistency, come to find out, is the name of the game. Back in homeroom, Brother Withers suffered us all. He ruthlessly enforced the dress code, measured my shaggy hair with a ruler, and all but demonstrated how to clench our butt cheeks together correctly. Corporal punishment was used on full-grown high schoolers, public shaming too. He harangued those he thought were oversexed or wanton or anyone else who dared voice skepticism. And over and over he insisted, just insisted that the earth was 4,000 years old and the devil put the dinosaur's bones in the ground. As much a florist of language as he was of lilacs and lilies, Brother Withers arranged verbal bouquets of fear, guilt, and gore. It was one gothic moral lesson after another. First century martyrs, disemboweled for their faith, medieval saints rectally tortured with iron dildos, 
sinful souls howling in the agony of hell, satyr-hoofed demons flaying the flesh of heretics. The student body also felt flayed and left for dead beneath Brother Withers' funeral spray of prose. Suffice it to say, the man was roundly hated by everyone. Except me. I didn't flinch. Lest I miss the slightest pearl of wisdom, I found his gnarly diatribes exhilarating. I ignored what they said about him. Here is a man from whom I could learn the secrets of the hidden world. It was a, a time when I finally was getting the hang of the banjo. We were gelling as a band and the recording quality. It was like in this like kind of lodge wooden room that you could hear like the slap of the bass. You could hear the banjo, the echo, the right amount of, just the right time when everybody was like starting to gel. We, lightning in a bottle, we caught it.
Well, what's next for old JD? Well, let's see. I am working on a sequel to The Vine That Ate the South. I'm working on it all the time. I'm consumed with it. It is like a, a, basically a nightmare journal that I took, and I'm now I'm trying to novelize it and retcon it somehow to be a sequel to The Vine That Ate the South. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Bouncing along, the balloon strikes an eye-popping hard candy contrast against the bleach of birch. And oh, how it does my old heart good. It's just hopping about, blowing lightly on the wind and dangling a small folded note at the end of a string. I'm about to catch it when five to 10 more balloons appear from nowhere, equally as red, equally as lost and swirling about my feet. As I stoop to scoop them up, we notice still another 50 to 100 more hanging about eye level throughout the woods, all of them in the slowest descent. It's as if they're in a stupor, sleepwalking through the calm. We awkwardly maneuver around each one, angling our shoulders left and right, careful not to disturb them. Soon hundreds, no, thousands of balloons have joined us, filling the landscape with bulbs of bright crimson. We, we briefly forget our need for shelter and come to a full halt within the event. They bring an oddly cheery, brief relief from our chaotic day. What the hell, Carver says, finally breaking the silence. I pick up one to examine the note. It says, just say no, Topeka 4-H, Kansas State Fair. Well, that's 500 miles away, Carver marvels. Folks must have set them loose at the fair, and they got sucked up into the jet stream. Man, they've come a long way. The first drops are starting to fall, and buddy, they are fat. Time to move. Our two-man peloton knows no bounds. We got to find shelter fast, or it's hell for certain. Off we go, pedaling hard. A distant air raid horn begins its Doppler wail. It sounds like a soprano staked and sacrificed to the Kraken. We're really booking it now. Our tires roll like hoop snakes, full tilt and pumping down the old spur line.
continued to speed along, cutting through the hazard town square. Then something again caught his eye. The courthouse was bustling with activity, swaddled in a million flags and that ever-present bunting. But Hazard, Kentucky had gone that extra mile for Independence Day 1976. Costumed teenagers posed like living statues high atop the court pillars that cornered the roof like turrets. You still see those characters every tax season. Teens hired to stand by the road dressed like the Statue of Liberty, green togas and face paint. Evidently, the city had employed them just to stand up there and impersonate the ladies' liberty and justice, plus a couple of founding fathers. Silly as it was, it had to be a tough job holding a pose on a pedestal, sweating in the sun for minimum wage. Their upheld torches and scales wobbled in straining poses of patriotic commitment. Daddy pulled the dots into a screeching halt, burst out onto the street and stood there staring at them with his hand in his pockets. It was a concentrated gaze with a wicked smile. To be sure, I followed his line of sight to the target, the young female statue standing nearest to us. I watched in horror as the girl's legs began to buckle until finally she fell four stories to her death. It didn't take long before Daddy had the other ones picked off as well. One by one, the youngsters toppled to their demise, cracking their heads and backs on the sidewalk below. It was right then and there, as horror swelled my senses, I understood that Daddy had indeed found what he was looking for. As screaming crowds formed and sirens wailed like wolf packs, Daddy started the car and drove us back home in silence. Silence, silent, save for Mama's carpenter's tape, which played in a loop the entire seven-hour ride. But he tops it off with a bottle of burglar's wine. To beat a blind man to death with his own damn cane on a jam back Saturday night. Well, he's the devil's understudy. You know he's always ready to fill in in a pinch. He tried to be your buddy, tried to be your honey, maybe just to get a little inch. Said the grinding wheel always. But you'll draw more flies with the greatest of these, with the Bible and the candle and stone. Parts floozy and flim flam. She's the ugly one in her one woman band. He ain't Mr. Right, but he's Mr. Right now. He's my presidential competence man. They're yeah, kissing hands and shaking babies from her to Katie's with his third place trophy bride. Planting seeds of deception like a cut to weed. Holding out, chopping and run for your life. Well, even the two headed fetus ought to have a good home. But if that's just the kind of thing that's going to piss you off, is this just Bible or candy and stuff? Bugs and bats took us one drop rule 
complimentary meal down a dirt road to Arkansas. Those hometown of hope and land. Like I said, the Shack Shakers have a, a new record coming out next year. It's a sequel to Cockadoodle Don't called Cockadoodle Do, and we have a lot of uh, guest artists on it. Uh, we have former Shack Shakers over the years, 25 years we've been a band, coming back and guesting. And we also have some of uh, the Western Kentucky region, Stanley Walker, Jack Martin, Chris Scruggs from Nashville, Earl Scruggs' grandson, and one of the old Crow Medicine Show guys, old timers and young fogies too. <laughs>